hello to all my soulful leaders out there. You have got to be super excited for this upcoming episode. And my lovely men out there who are listening, this is an extraordinary man that has a heart of gold and eyes of an eagle to see a vision for what we both men and women and humanity can be reaching. And I got to tell you, um, the place where I'm at right now in my heart, my heart is breaking open. And, you know, I've been going through a lot with who am I and, you know, is this mine to do? And what is mine to do? And there's that doing again. And, and what does it mean to really develop the internal? What does the internal even mean? For a long, long time, I kept thinking about what, what does inner work? What is inner work? Like, I, I don't know, like, is that working with my itty bitty shitty committee or something? Or I don't know what that means. Let me tell you, this podcast with Stu, he talks about taking our presence and being present and what that means to really hold space for the love and the tenderness to be able to work with those parts inside of ourselves that are hurting or suffering or struggling with control. And I got to tell you, I am just so delighted and proud of this young, incredible man who I met many years ago at university who has evolved into the most extraordinary, wonderful guy, man. Soulful leader. Soulful he leader. He really is. I cannot wait for you all to listen to today's episode. So please do share it with a friend. Visit us in our Facebook group after you've listened because we would love your feedback. Enjoy. In a world where achievements and accolades motivate us to do more and be more, we're often left wondering, is this really it? Deep inside, you know there is more to life. You're ready to leave behind the old push your way through and claim the deeper life that's calling you. That's where we excel. We're your hosts, Stephanie Allen and Marin Oslak. And this is the Soulful Leader Podcast. Sit back and relax as we share the shortcuts we've uncovered to help you make shift happen. Hi, welcome to the Soulful Leader Podcast. This is Stephanie Allen, and I'm here with Stu Murray and my regular co-host, Marin Oslak, and we are super excited about having Stu on today. I just want to say I have known Stu for, oh gosh, I haven't seen him for a while, but I've, I met him years and years and years ago, <laughs> back when he was uh, an early educator. Now he's, uh, you know, such a deep soul and caring, compassionate being who, um, really wants to have a deeper conversation of who we are, why we're here, and to help to unfold that in the world and why that's important. So wonderful to have you here, Stu. Thank you so much for joining myself and Marin today. Thank you. I I was quite surprised when I saw your name pop up in my inbox and uh, felt the, the hair stand up on my skin. So it was really, really a, a pleasure to reconnect after so long. So Stu, I have a question. What about that connection kind of touched your heart that made you feel like, ooh, this is this is something I'm very called to? You know, like oftentimes when when somebody says that, the hair stood up, it's like, ooh, wait, attention. I, you got my attention. What is it that felt like it got your attention? Well, I think it was from the seed that was planted way back. When I first met Stephanie, I was playing football at university, so like semi-professional football occupying an entire different world, uh, worldview, a space day to day and the people that were in my sphere. And she became this little tender to start planting seeds in me that led to this big shift. And so now 10 years later to, to have that pop up in an inbox after there's been so much ongoing transformation, I've just felt a lot of gratitude to connect and curious to explore being on an, on a new podcast. Wow, That's... you just touched touched my heart. How grateful I you never know <laughs> what you, you know, how you affect somebody else, do you? Mm -hmm. And I just listening to what you said, I'm like, you know, having that flashback of my memory of you too. And it's like I don't ever want to call myself a healer or a teacher. I don't I think that's 
kind of an ego. I think we're all, you know, we all have the inner healer and teacher inside of us. And, and really it's about collectively coming together and creating space for that unfoldment. And I have to say, as knowing you as being in my, in my classes at the time and having those conversations, I was, I was touched by your soul, by your hunger for consciousness and, and, and the passion that used to light up in your eyes. And I'm like, when you see that reflected back, you can sometimes go, oh, goodness, I'm not alone in this world, <laughs> you know? And I know our listeners are probably going, yeah, you know, we're listening too. And, and those listeners, you all out there are also passionate seekers. And I'm so grateful that we're traveling this journey together. Mm, totally. when, you, when you said that, one of the things I thought about is, we've spoken many times about the fact that a leader, many people don't think of themselves as leaders and we don't realize how much impact we have on the people around us and that we've touched somebody at a level that all of us touch people at levels that we have no clue about. And how many years later, it's kind of cool to, to get that, that feedback from once in a while of like, oh my gosh, really? And that's that that is that's what a soulful leader is. And so I'm excited to hear a little bit about where you so you say that there's been a lot of transformation and where you've gone to. Can you share a little bit about that and what the transformation is and you know, kind of what what brought you to that place? I mean, to go from a professional footballer to I'm not even sure. So tell us about that. Sure. I'll I'll do my best to keep it uh, short and sweet with all of that. And, and just to, to reflect too, I, I actually genuinely believe that a leader is not somebody who occupies a position of authority, but somebody who brings out the best in people and in processes. And so, you know, from that vantage point, it offers us all an invitation to be able to step into that, no matter what position we occupy in our lives and what roles we identify as. So I, I, I love really, that definition. Mm, Thank yeah. you for sharing that. Pleasure. And so, yeah, I mean, for me, it's been a, it's been a wild journey. I, I have been a curious individual for a long, long time and have contemplated ideas and have been really scared, honestly, by ideas of what happens when I die and mm -hmm. why am I here and what is going on? I remember even looking back recently into some of my old journals back in 2011, 2012, and, and just pick and scratch, but just frantically trying to make sense of this stuff with my mind and to be able to find the answers. And it seemed to parallel this journey that I had in sport where so much of my identity was wrapped up in sport. And that made things easier when I was able to fit into a category or find belonging through some tribe, through some group, it was, it took a weight off of me that I didn't need to reflect on. And then in 2012, it seemed to be like this, where I started to enter that dark night of the soul, because I had a traumatic longboarding accident where I knocked myself out unconscious and split my helmet in half and slid unconscious into a ditch. And, and my memory was never the same. My ability to be present, my emotional instability, all of these things just went haywire. And obviously that was also the end of my professional sporting career. So at the same time that I lost that sense of belonging in those groups, I was also flung into this emotional turbulence and an inability to focus like I had and an inability to remember, which I had relied on my intellect as much of my identity also. So it, I, like every label and piece of confidence that I had to ground me and attach to seem to just disintegrate underneath my feet. And I also had headaches every single day. And I had tried medication. I had tried all these alternatives to work with my doctor to get there. And never, not only did I not find any prescription or anything that helped me, I, I didn't even feel heard or seen within that mm -hmm. because I was in crisis mode. I, I had literally been brought to, if this is how my life is, I, I can't continue. Wow. It, it brought it brought me to my knees yeah. and that was when I started I had discovered yoga actually um, in a summer just prior to 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 start training my body as a companion with the workouts that I was doing and to 
benefit from injury prevention. And that year, actually, I received most improved player at the at the university. And that's no coincidence that yoga mm -hmm. came into my life at that time. But what really started to shift is that laid the groundwork for me realizing that this is so much beyond that. And the first time I found reprieve from the headaches was the space between my experiences and my thoughts when I sat in meditation and when I moved my body. And when I was able to step into that space, honest to God, it saved me. It saved me. And that really piqued my curiosity. It, it finally created a, a grounding spot. And so that's why I was that hungry student because I had all these unanswered questions and I was going through tremendous turmoil. And that ended up after university, I sold everything I owned and bought a one-way ticket to India. I had three grand in my pocket and said, you know, I, I just want to learn about mm. these cultures. I want to learn about this philosophy. It's very different than the Western mode of uh, understanding. And it's really this peeling back these layers of the onion to get to who I really am. And so I thought three grand would last me a couple months. It lasted over a year and mm. managed to pull that out and do some yoga trainings and have since you know, been sharing that gift with people as well, uh, more on the side, but it's been a beautiful practice that I, I feel privileged to be able to share with other individuals. That's such a powerful story. And I have, I have multiple things that I want to ask you about. I'm, I do I'm too. so curious right now. <laughs> yeah, I have some questions as well. For sure. Yeah. I think the first one I would love to kind of dive into is when you say yoga in, in the West here, we have this concept of yoga as um, a physical movement practice. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> right an exercise uh, a detox program with hot yoga you know like it's it's become something in the west which only probably only we could create <laughs> out of this spiritual practice mm -hmm. can you tell us from your perspective um kind of what the difference is and what you found about yoga in the east yeah absolutely and i, I think as we enter into that space, I'd like to put out a, a statement saying, I think it's great if somebody goes to a yoga class and moves their body and feels good and that stops there. Like, I, I think if somebody can be more connected with their body and that's them showing up and then they become a better partner, a better parent, a better friend, better member to society, that's amazing. And that's what brought me in the door. And so I, I really try and not discriminate about what brings people to these places and the intentions we have, because there are subtle, unseen things that are happening that we might not even know or recognize, despite we have entered into that with a particular intention. But you're right. In the West, what we call yoga is actually what is referred to as asana, which is the practice of the physical forms. And it's a very important practice to be able to get the body comfortable so that we can sit and so that we can then learn to control our breath. And then so that we can sit longer in periods of meditation so that we can go inside and really start to listen. Mm. But yoga in the East, actually the word yoga means it comes from the root word yoga to unite. And so that is just this open door of exploration. And well, what am I trying to unite here? And that could be anything. It could be the uniting the breath with the body, with the mind, with spirit. It could be uniting our ego, our, our individual meat suit with some divine unfolding of reality. You know, it, it gives us a creativity to explore what that union and that connection like look could look like. And I think part of that too is just allowing us to get out of our own way, allowing us to shed all of these judgments and perceptions we have about what is right and what is wrong. It's easy to do that on the other side and, you know, profess all of these spiritual beliefs that are just really shrouded in judgment. And so I think it's really a practice of letting go and moving into surrender and acceptance and not a passive surrender, but just this really beautiful, authentic place of being. 
Okay. You've totally set me up for my question. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much. You know, it's one of those things that I've always wanted to kind of share around yoga too. It's like, it's not just about the body people. It's mm -hmm. so much more. It's so much about love and connection. And we so need that in this world, but I want to bring you back to what you had mentioned with this whole idea of searching and uniting and connecting is that we get really attached to the identity. Mm. And you mentioned that, and, and you know, you were a high level, pro, like high level athlete. You were, it could have set you up for your whole life for, you know, the outer world success. Right. And all of a sudden at the moment you had it taken away from you. And that, like you said, it opened up your dark night of the soul, which always illuminates us. And I think we forget that. I always say pain breaks us open to let the light in and to let the light out. It's like, it, it creates that union, but I want to hear more about you know, can you tell us more about identity and why it's important to hold it loosely <laughs> and, and not to get so attached to it because of the suffering? Like, and, and what your process was to actually start to help you let go of that ident identity so that you could evolve. I would love to hear more about that, Stu. Wow. That's a juicy, juicy <laughs> question. I love it. And I think, honestly, I'd like to even kind of capture that in, in where we're at societally right now, because I think some of the biggest struggles and barriers we're facing is tribalism and identity politics and our ability to get out of our own way, because ultimately there is more that connects us than there is that divides us. And I think it's important to distinguish just being a doormat and being passive and being like, oh, it's all fine, because it's not always all fine. There's times where we need to stand firm in our truth. And so I like to say, it's, a, it's good to have firm, strong beliefs, but held loosely. And, and so what that means to me is that I think a lot and I reflect a lot, but I need to be able to be open to opinions and ideas from all perspectives. And the more I can have those things challenged, that will either bring me deeper into truth and to solidify a particular idea or allow me to change and take adopt a new perspective that is better serving me. And so I think there's this aspect of us that's that's a lot deeper. And so we we're in a place where religion has not had the same grasp as it has for hundreds of years. And so that starts to get replaced with other things like veganism or crossfitters or whatever identity or whatever group that we can find belonging in because all of us fundamentally have this desire for for belonging mm -hmm. and to express ourselves authentically and yet what's the the thing the the real truth is is that the only thing that's truly blocking us from that deep desire that we have is our own mind and the perception that we are separate to begin with and so it's not clinging to any particular belief or any particular dogma that's going to actually lead me there. And the more I actually cling to those beliefs, the more suffering I'm going to create for myself and the more division that I'm going to perpetuate into the world. And so for me, I, I actually stopped worrying about what happens when I die. I stopped worrying about all of these things because I've realized that what's important is I'm alive here. And if I want to align myself with a higher power, well, then I need to be cherishing and respectful and kind and compassionate to all things without discernment all if ever, it's either everything's god or nothing is mm. yeah it, so, it's, like, it's like that black yeah. and white thinking that limits yeah. us right and and it can get us really rigid and holding yeah. on to an identity over here or over on the other side and both of those are going to pull us apart yeah it, it totally and and we've seen that look at it's probably hyperinflated by our social spheres and the the weaponizing of fear and hatred that's been coming at us from different places but it is it's it's this idea that it's either this or that and we forget that it could be this and that and there can be truth in so many different perspectives and how do we bring an opportunity to honor that there are so many infinite truths all around us. And the more open we can be, the more we'll learn, the more we'll grow, and the, the deeper we'll connect. So we'll actually achieve that goal even more. The other thing about that is that the more joyous your own life becomes. You know, we mm. have this striving that we do in this culture for all of the stuff. 
And we think that that's what's going to, the stuff is going to make us happy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of our teachers says, you know, get, go for it, get all the stuff. Because at that point in time, when you've achieved everything, whether it's, you know, a status symbol or the money or whatever it is, you know, pleasing your parents, make sure that you, you go for it and you get all of it because you'll get there and you'll realize it's not it. I'm None still empty. It it. I'm still empty. <laughs> and that's where, you know, there's, you mentioned doorways, like that's most people's doorways and yoga could be a doorway. There are lots of doorways and, and, you know, you get to that place, there needs to be a dark night of the soul. There needs to be a place where you go, this isn't it. And I can't keep going in this direction because I'll go crazy. And that is a problem in our culture right now one of eight i just heard a statistic this morning one out of eight people on our planet has got mental illness Ooh. one out of eight and this is the society i mean this is the time of it because of this exactly what we're talking about is we keep doing here you know, like the whole definition of insanity keep doing the same thing expecting a different result and yet that's what we're doing yeah. And we keep going after the material in the outer and the material in the outer. And it is, it, you know, it's meant to be there so that we, we, we strive for it and we don't get what we're really looking for, which is what you're talking about, Stu, is that inner connection. The unity is on the inner level. Mm, mm, absolutely. And it, it's also reflected on the outer. And so we can work in and we can work out. And <laughs> I've always held this concept that relationship is a mirror. And so everything outside of us, everything that we are in relation to is an opportunity for us to be able to understand and see ourselves more clearly, both what we love and what we don't. And so it's always a beautiful invitation for us to say, wow, I love that th this person sees me. And so that becomes this inf invitation for me to step in and put away all my self-talk and all of these limiting beliefs that I've ascribed to and step into that more beautiful person that I, I know I am. Or I get triggered and there's, oh, there's, there's my inner child. There's that little boy in me who has heard all these years and is using his intellect or deferring to all these other strategies so that he can avoid feeling this pain and these trauma all of these things just offer us an opportunity to go back. And so that connection is, is a two way it's the outer and it's the inner, and there's not really a boundary between those. I just yeah. want to say, I love your heart and soul. What you just said about honoring that little boy in its whole, in, in, in his process of feeling, because as a man, <laughs> I, I work with many, many men and they control that. Mm -hmm. And there's so many, identities around you know what a, who a man should be and what a man should or shouldn't do and i just i just want to really respect you for what you just said about the mirror of relationship and really to go inside and to care for that little boy mm. and and to tell us Thank a little you. bit more about that because i think the men that are listening you know it, it can be a really supportive connection as well as the women who I have the men in their lives that can understand and create space for them to be able to really feel. So if you could speak mm. more to that. Totally. I, men have been uh, really not offered many tools in particular and discouraged from expressing emotion. And these things often when emotions not expressed, it's repressed. And that repression can lead to depression. It can lead to all of these challenging things that will come up into us and th those things will start to govern us and I started to realize that I've been doing work for a long time and I had been in a relationship not that long ago that really brought up some of these inner wounds and I was just realizing that okay I'm in this reactive state I'm not able to listen I'm deferring to my intellect I'm deferring to all of these other tools that have at one point in my life protected me whether that was when I was a child and I was scared of being abandoned or I was, you know, told myself I was abandoned or I had received harsh criticisms in challenging moments, all of these things stuck with me. And at one level, I didn't realize that those dramatic patterns 
regardless of how big or small, it's easy to think, well, I had a pretty good childhood and downplay our traumas, but they're there and they're hijacking our ability to be present with our partners, with our children, with our friends, with our families. And as long as I'm going from a reactive state, well, then I'm not going to be that partner that I need to be. I'm not going to be able to listen with presence. And if I want to be a man in this world, to be a man requires presence. A woman needs to be heard. She needs to be acknowledged that she's enough, that she's worthy, and that we can be able to hold this. And so being able to step into that presence and depth is only a place that we can step into if we're able to look at ourselves and our traumas and our patterning so that we can really put that shit aside and be able to be there and be present with with what really is not the stories about what we're telling ourselves it is and trying to keep ourselves safe and protected yeah that's so powerful <laughs> i love hearing that and we uh we recently i was just looking it up we recently did a podcast i think it was number 60 with a woman named shelly and she's got a whole system for helping people to move through those um, the patterning from that, that we were raised with. And I think a lot of times we make the assumption, well, Stephanie likes to call it the itty bitty shitty committee. So the itty bitty <laughs> shitty committee gets on our butt saying that like, we're not supposed to like, Oh, you're supposed to be over that. You're supposed to be this. You're supposed to be that you're supposed to be, is that blah, blah, blah. And instead of realizing like, like that was all meant to be there so that I could, actually get the gifts of moving through mm. it and mm. getting to the other side. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's like Sue Johnson talks about that in her book, No Bad Parts, and these ideas that we have protector parts and these pieces of us that have actually served us. But there might come a time where th those things aren't serving us. And that other piece I learned quite a bit about was the idea of reparenting work and doing and understanding that inner child. And so actually going back to experiences and traumatic events that I've had that tend to show up and tend to continue to be present. And what I realized is that, well, that little boy is there and what he needs is a man to show up and he needs somebody to hold him and let him know it's okay. And if he can be held in such a way and his nervous system can be calmed, well, then I can step into being present. Mm. Then I can start to own my stuff. And I can hear criticism because somebody's inviting me into a better version of myself. And so rather than wall up and armor up, I can hold that little boy and know that he's safe to hear this criticism, that he's safe to be able to step into that more beautiful version of who he's being called to. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I mean, I, I witness it in myself too. It's yeah. like, you know, little Stephanie, you know, and, yeah. and we don't see the person in front of us. We see our past. We see our, and our past patterns of survival and protection and, and to push away or to grasp and hold on. And those push, pull, push, pull kind of energies, it, it just makes us like exhausted, doesn't it? Hmm. And I, and, and thank you for bringing up the inner parent I, I love that inner parent training. I, I've been involved in that for the last two and a half years myself, and it has saved me. And I mean that in that way of like, because the, the children, the inner children will literally take over the household. They literally will make a freaking mess, you know, like they're like shitting in the corner and making messes and coloring on the walls and, you know, you know, shooting, I don't know, whatever at each other, food fights, all that stuff. And it's like, it's a bloody mess. Where are the parents? And are the parents critical and judgmental and shaming or is the parent loving and kind? And I love what you said. I just had this image of a loving father mm. who had all the space in his heart to just said, oh, look at you. Oh, come here. Come up and just let me let me give you a hug. And what do you need in little buddy? Like, you know, and if we could get that inside, how much our outer worlds, oh, breathing space, how much more the outer world would change, wouldn't it? Yeah, well, we can stop dropping all of these guards that we have. And it's, it's it's funny because connection is what we desire. And yet, unconsciously, we perpetuate disconnection in order to try and keep ourselves safe. And so the very thing that we're longing for, there's, an, there's a part of us that's 
actively blocking that. And so we want to go out and try and use force and control, particularly as a man to manipulate and change my outside environment so that I can find connection, so that I can find peace, so that I can bring whatever I want. But the reality is, is that I need to turn my gaze in, inward mm. and say, well, what walls inside do I need to drop? It's not a matter of more force that's required. It's a matter of intention. It's a matter of presence and deepening and understanding that I need to actually step into. There's not any dramatic force that's required to get there. And being with what is just yeah. being, being. That's the the piece that I really, that stood out for me. And the reason that it, I, I'll tell you the piece for a moment. And the reason I'll tell you the reason first, <laughs> the reason that it stood out to me is because I'm working on for myself, really embracing my inner feminine. And I know we haven't used those words. And oftentimes Stephanie will refer to it as the yin and the yang and that inner, that receptiveness, that, that piece of inner feminine and to hear a man talk about it of, it's like you were both talking about the inner parenting and the parenting, here's the deal. We all have both the mother and the father. Right. And the only way that you'll show up with that compassionate father that Stephanie was talking about is if you've embraced your inner feminine. And I'm not just talking about you as a man, I'm talking about me as a woman. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm working on because oh, yeah. I tend to have that harsh push, do, go out there, you know, like that's how I was raised. I was a, I was a tomboy. I didn't even want to be a girl. <laughs> I was like, I was angry at my parents that I was a girl. <laughs> and so to hear that from, and you know, it's interesting that I've been attracting more of the men out there who have that compassion and have what you're talking about and what you're pointing to. And I love having the discussion with someone who is of the masculine you know energy that's also doing the same work and it just yeah. like i said that's why it stood out to me <laughs> it's like yay <laughs> that's beautiful i and honestly that's exactly where i've been and i think it's a testament to the work that you're doing as to that's exactly why you're attracting men who are stepping into the sacred masculine right and and that's a concept i've been exploring more lately as I have started to heal that duality with inside myself and, mm. and do that reparenting work is this idea of polarity. And so even in our relationships and dynamics, we can create these healthy polarities within this. And so I've invited in a, a sacred feminine in, into my life. And through her, I my self-talk is totally transformed. And it's it's something that I've already been doing and softening on my own, but to see that reflect in somebody else and somebody who can hold those parts of me that I, I am harsh around myself and feel like I deserve to be spoken to in such a way. And to see that melt away and that suffering and that trauma transformed and healed. And for her on the other side, to, to be with a man who knows what he wants, who can be present, who when she gets in her stories and when she gets all these things going on, to be able to just say, babe, I see you. To look mm -hmm. her in the eyes or to just be the presence. It's like, I don't need to intellectualize this at all. I just need to be here in my full presence. And I think that kind of polarity work, it, it, it's, it makes sense that most women are actually in a dominant masculine because we're in a dominant world and so we we overcompensate to try and control and manipulate but then we're going to be attracting weak men because if the if the woman's overdeveloped in her feminine or in her masculine she'll be attracting men who she can direct that relationship with entirely and so it's an interesting shift that i've started to notice in my life and it's funny we're here landing on this because it's been one of my <laughs> biggest meditations in the last while as well I'll tell you, it, I can see the pattern of my own life, you know, and, and you're absolutely right. And the best way to accelerate one's love and consciousness is to see the mirror, is to be in a relationship. And we're in relationship, whether it's a, a couple, whether it's a parent child, whether it's at work, we're always in relationships. And, and how do we become that adult in relationship yeah. instead of the little child or the teenager? 
I, 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 I could tell you, I, I think I've mastered the teenager. I know it wasn't really <laughs> a, um, a, a very outgoing teenager. I was more withdrawn and shy and if you can believe it, but it's true. <laughs> and I, I feel like even that part that got suppressed, it, it comes out in, in now because I am in an adult body and I have have a certain level of security, but now she runs like crazy out there and she can be angry and fiery. And it's like, okay, whoa, slow down there, Steph. Like, okay, 15 year old Stephanie, like chill, like cool the jets. Like she's all out there with, uh, you know, rebellion. And, and it's like, there's a time and place for that. But I love what you're saying to embody, you know, more of the feminine for both masculine feminine we're in both and, and how do we find that i call it the king and the queen we often are prince and princess looking for each other and then we wonder why shit happens right it's because you're meant to ascend to the throne and it's so interesting in our outer world you know recently having the monarchy the, the queen i would say you know as as inside so outside you know you're seeing the queen that has passed and it's time for the return of the king but what kind of king is going to step in? That's going to be up to us, isn't it? Mm. Because we are the mirror of the collective and the collective is a mirror of us. And, and, and we get to do this right now. It's such an amazing time. What a gift. It really Truly. is. <laughs> so Truly. I have a, Stu, I know. So we've gone a little bit into kind of your transition and I, I'm really fascinated to hear a little bit about now that you're back, you've spent your time in India and, and you've come home and what has that led you to like, where are your passions now? I, I know you have a podcast and I want to hear more about that. And I, I really want to explore with you kind of like where you're headed and what feels like it's calling you. Mm. Yes. Yeah, also a loaded question I, I got back from India back in 2014 so I I kind of lived nomadically for a while on and off and uh, kept continuing to see the world and then finally came back and settled and wanted to work in education and so I actually did my education degree with the intention to bring more mindfulness and self-regulation skills to young people because I found if we can provide these kids with these opportunities man mm. what what could we unleash in this world? What What is possible? I can't even imagine. And so the last six years I had spent in public education doing pretty unorthodox projects from helping redesign pull-out programs that were working with some of the most vulnerable kids in the schools and teaching meditation and engaging in circles and, you know, open dialogue and entrepreneurial activities and passion-led projects uh, spearheading community initiatives, helping support teachers all across the province with entrepreneurial endeavors for their students, over 8,000 kids in one year. Uh, wow. So it, it's been, it's been pretty profound. It's, it's hard to even wrap all of that up in a little, even in one podcast, let alone many, I, I'm very passionate about education and I think it's fundamental and it shapes how we see the world. And I've come to learn that schooling can often be synonymous with conformity and compliance. And I, my intention when I entered, you know, was mindfulness, but really I realized that what I really wanted to do is help reconnect individuals with that wild self. We are a wild species and beyond our domestication, there's an intuition within us. There's an instinct. And at some point along the way, be it through our parenting and our schooling and other different events, we've we started to learn to deafen that in order to mm -hmm. maintain belonging we sacrifice our authenticity we sacrifice listening to that voice within inside of our heart and i think i truly believe in the goodness of individuals and i i think honestly that people are doing the best they can with where they're at and the more people can be in touch with that whisper that's within their heart and act from a place of of that healed masculine, of that healed feminine, doing our inner work, if we can align that with listening to our voices, I just think that is where it has to go. And that, so that offered me that meditation and education to really reflect on these things. And I thought that that's the case for, for young people. And it's the case for big young people. 
also, mm. <laughs> where we're scared to be ourselves. We're scared to tell the truth. We're scared to step into that space, though we're, we're called. And so we're living in this internal tension and conflict. And for me, it always comes back to that cliche, be the change. How do I step into that radical, authentic self? How do I let go of my preconceived ideas of how I've been told by society or by others how I think I should show up? And what am I really called in this moment to show up and do? And after many years of banging my head against bureaucracy and in the most beautiful of ways, but <laughs> another mirror, right? <laughs> right. Another, 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 Yet mirror, another you know? mirror. To I love that to image though. <laughs> I bang my head up against bureaucracy in the most loving of ways. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, it's, a great they image. Are good, it's a good mirror. It's a good mm -hmm. mirror. And I've met people within that who are, are really doing beautiful things. And I've learned that there are amazing individuals within all of these systems. But the, a lot of these systems that we've had are old and outdated and are not set up in a way that are serving individuals best. And so I've since chosen to step outside of that structure to continue to support that vision of having people empowered as individuals. And I actually just published a book a couple of weeks, a month and a half ago on uh, education as well on experiential learning frameworks. So we we co-authored a book with a professor, a friend of mine, and a graphics designer, um, nature school educator of mine. So, yeah, it's cool. it's exciting. I'll definitely be continuing to to do that work because I think it's fundamental to the societal shifts that we need to have, but yes. Um, yes. not within the bureaucracy at this point. Yeah. You know, our does our uh, education system is all based on the industrial, you know, model, and so it doesn't it doesn't work for us anymore. And I I support all the efforts of the people that are working both within it and outside of it That's to right. change it because it's essential. It's absolutely essential. Yeah. Um, I would love to, and just so that everybody remembers out there, all of our listeners, is that I link everything in the show notes. So the stuff that we mentioned about Shelley's podcast and um, the Sue Johnson book that Stu mentioned and his book. Tell us the name of your book, Stu. Yeah, it's called Care to Make a Difference. And the word okay. care is an acronym for the cycle of authentic and relevant engagement. Mm -hmm. and so it's really about... Um, Going beyond, uh, as we step into this new experiential model of, of learning, oftentimes teachers are just doing activities with their kids. So they'll go and bake the cookie or do these things. But the I think the real next evolution of that is actually being able to build critical thinkers with the capacity to communicate and self-reflect, mm -hmm. to be able to give and receive feedback in critical ways to be able to figure out where they're at and make decisions and how to move forward. And so we've created a framework around activities and you could take any activity really and how to pull in all different kinds of curriculum. So I wanna see the silos of education, the math, the science. I wanna see these bl blown out of the water and create days for kids where they can be led by their passion, led by their curiosity and led by their drive to make a difference in the world. Because I've worked with enough kids to know that all of those things are innate in every single human being. And yeah. so what if we could create a school system and a way of learning that actually tapped into these innate gifts that we have? Stu, I love that question, that call to action. And I know there are some of my listeners who are educators that are listening right here, right now. So you all, I know you know who you are. I want you to get in contact with me because I'm giving you Stu's email. Because I know they're searching. I know they're searching and they're people just like you like talk about belonging. It's like, how do we come together as, as lovers, as beings, as caretakers, as of our own inner world and unite together to make something that is so much more beautiful together than on our own? Yeah. Especially something thank that you. supports the next generation. Yeah. Oh, and so thank and you for holding like, that vision. I think it's beautiful vision. It is. Yeah. It is. And it's true. I mean, doing anything less would be a disservice to to all of humanity. And we say, oh, we're preparing kids for the future. Let's prepare them for now. I've seen 11 year olds take actions that 40 year olds say it can't be done. So I, I don't see any point in waiting. Yeah. <sighs> 
There is a a book, there's a young man that actually unfortunately passed away at age 14. And I think the name of his book is called um, Don't Tell Me I Can't. Just a phenomenal young man. And his parents raised him in a way where they never told him he couldn't do it. Everything, and he, he was cute because in his book, um, he talks about, I mean, a 14 year old wrote an, an autobiography. Isn't that amazing? Just before the year, the, the year that he passed. And, you know, it's like, yeah, the, the self knowing on that just amazing. Anyway, his parents raised him in such a way of like, let him explore his curiosities. And it, it's all about the education system. It's a phenomenal book. If you haven't read it, you'll, you'll love it. And so will all of your educators out there. It's yes, it pulls on your heartstrings because yes, a 14 year old young man did pass away and an amazing one at that. And yet he put in place things that will in his short 14 years, he put in place things that will revolutionize our world. Yeah. Literally. I look forward to reading that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So well, I, uh, I, I, I could probably talk to you all day, Stu, and we don't have all day, so I apologize. What I would love is how would people get in contact with you if they're interested in continuing a conversation or having you on their podcast or, you know, even, you know, just checking out. I know we mentioned that you have a podcast or talking to you about education. How would they reach you? Yeah. I would love to hear from anybody who has felt uh, called from this interview to to reach out. I am always keen to connect with other like-minded kindred spirits who are who know in their hearts that there's that more beautiful world and who are taking those steps to live into that. So uh, I've got a website stumurray.com and the podcast is stumurray podcast where we're I'm trying to create a space where we can have honest conversations and explore nuance and challenging conversations within this society about where we can go forward and talking with people who are in the trenches doing that and contributing to a more connected, a more beautiful world. And yeah, so the, I'm there, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram and um, TikTok. I actually just don't normally operate in those spaces, but I, I've tapped into some help to start to enter that so I could help spread some of that message more. So you can reach me on any of those things or through my website and and send me an email that way. And I'd love to chat. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I know my heart is more full from having, having had the opportunity to get to know you. Yeah, and I can just say, pleasure. wow, wow, wow. I just like, I think my future self must have recognized you that first day you came into the yoga <laughs> class. And I'm just, I'm blown away in the most beautiful way. And I'm so grateful to have you as part of our podcast too. So thank you, Stu. And I so support you and and hold that vision with you. Thank you. It's amazing the way the roads can twist and turn and us not seeing the, you know, the far off implications of all of that. But yeah, it's, it's, it's just beautiful. I appreciate you taking the time and the openness of how this conversation flowed. I, I love where we went. <laughs> it's awesome. Okay. That's great. So for our listeners, remember, everything is in the show notes. You don't have to write anything down. Uh, you can go and get links to everything, including Stu's website. And please join us in our Facebook group or in our LinkedIn group at the Soulful Leaders. We would love your comments and you could I bet you you could connect with Stu there too. So we'll see you either in the Facebook group, on the LinkedIn group, or right here next week. Thanks so much for joining us. And that wraps up another episode of the Soulful Leader Podcast with your hosts, Stephanie Allen and Marin Oslak. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to dive deeper, head over to our website at thesoulfulleaderpodcast.com. Until next time. 